The Baltimore Orioles hung with the New York Yankees this weekend to open up the second half, but in the end, it was just too much Aaron Judge as the Yankees came in and took two of three from the Orioles in Baltimore. I'll recap the entire weekend series coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, July 25th, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we're going to recap a weekend of baseball with the Orioles dropping a series, losing two out of three to the New York Yankees at Camden Yards in their first series of the second half of the season coming out of the All-Star break. And I'm going to get you my three big takeaways from the weekend series against the Yankees. And that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by BlueNile.com. Make your moments sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And going on now is the Blue Nile anniversary sale. Save up to 40% on classic fine jewelry pieces, and 25% on engagement ring settings. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. And before we get to O's and Yankees, just wanted to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. Locked on Orioles is free and available on all podcast listening platforms. We get you episodes Monday through Friday, new episode five days a week here on the podcast feed. And we thank you so, so much for tuning in. And again, we're here on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube channel. We'll continue to roll out some draft coverage, not as in-depth as we did for the first four picks as uh, we went in-depth into the Orioles' first four selections all throughout last week on the pod. So make sure to go check those out. Again, we thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. And for your first listen today, Orioles and Yankees. Three games set over the weekend at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Started on Friday night, Yankees 7, Orioles 6. As the O's went down, tried to make a comeback. Anthony Santander, a three-run homer off of Rolas Chapman in the seventh. But the O's couldn't scratch across one more run, and they fall 7-6. to six. Then you go to Saturday, where the Orioles go down 3 nothing, stage a big comeback, and they win it 6-3. to three. They packed Camden Yards to tie the series at one game apiece. But the O's bats just went silent on Sunday, finishing off the series with a 6 nothing loss to the Yankees on Sunday as uh, Nestor Cortez just dominated the O's in Sunday's game. And the Orioles come away with just one out of three on the weekend. Now 47-48 and 48 overall. But as I'm recording this, the Mariners are down big to the Astros in the fifth inning. The Astros can finish that off. The O's will still be only three and a half games back of the third and final wild card spot in the American League. But I want to get you my three big takeaways from the series lost to the Yankees over the weekend. And my first big takeaway starts on the positive side, that Jorge Mateo, he is an electric player anytime, but when he's hitting like he is now, he's one of the most fun players to watch in all of baseball. Mateo, Over the weekend, goes 4 for 12 for the Orioles with three singles, a double, and two RBIs. No strikeouts and no walks at the plate. And yeah, he only had three hard-hit balls over the weekend. But he got on base seemingly at the best times. And here's the best thing about Mateo as well. He did not strike it out. He didn't walk, but he did not strike out all weekend. That was the first time all season that Jorge Mateo had gone an entire three-game series without striking out. Now, he had gone a two-game series without striking out, actually earlier this month when the O's swept those two games in Chicago against the Cubs, and he had actually bookended that with three in a row without a strikeout. But this is the first full three-game series he's gone without a strikeout. And that's been really the big thing of Jorge Mateo getting the bat back. Remember, he swung it fairly well in April and then just not a great May, a horrendous June at the plate for Mateo. He was hitting around 150, but... He swung things back together. He's hitting right around 260 in the month of July so far, and he had a hit in all three games this weekend. He's now on a six-game hitting streak where he's 8 for 24 in that stretch, and overall, he's on a nine-game on-base streak going back to that first game 
in Chicago against the Cubs. And over these last nine games for Jorge Mateo, he is 12 for 35. That is a 343 batting average with three doubles, two triples, and a home run. He's driven in three runs. He's walked once, but he's only struck out three times in his last nine games. And you know the strikeouts have been a huge issue his entire career in the big league since coming up uh, originally with the Padres. And this is a different Mateo if he's not striking out. He's not going to hit over 300 for longer stretches, but he can get on base. It allows him to steal bases, allows him to wreak havoc on the base paths, and play the elite defense at shortstop that he's played all year. And we saw this weekend, although the Leos could only get one out of the three wins, when Mateo can actually get himself on base, this is a different team. Just look at the 6-3 win on Saturday. You know, he starts the rally in the fifth. Orioles trailing 3-0 with Garrett Cole rolling along through four scoreless innings. Cole gets the first two batters of the bottom of the fifth. Mateo's up. You're thinking, you know, we're going to the sixth, still down 3 nothing. And Mateo just, you know, lines himself a, a single into center field. Then he steals second base. And then Cedric Mullins bloops a single in that scores Mateo and makes it a 3-1 to one game. And he started that rally because then Mullins stole second and Adley Rutschman crushed a two-out RBI double to make it 3-2. to two. And the O's were right back in that game in the fifth inning. And then you go to the seventh. And who else but Jorge Mateo is right back in the middle of the action. He lines an RBI single off of Garrett Cole after a leadoff double. And the single ties the game at three. And then, you know, they go to Abreu out of the bullpen. They pull Cole. Mateo's the guy who gets him out. And what do you know? Abreu, before even throwing a pitch, tries to throw over to first to pick off Mateo. Well, pickoff throw gets away. That was the most exciting pickoff error I've ever seen. Mateo never even considered the fact that he would just go first to second on the pickoff error. It gets away from the first baseman, rolls up the right field line. Mateo never stops goes first to third on a pickoff error. Kevin Brown, the Orioles broadcaster, tweeted out on Sunday morning, it was his fastest peak sprint speed of the season. Mateo was at 31.6 feet per second in that sprint from first to third. The best runner in the league is Trey Turner. He averages 30.4 feet per second. And Mateo was at 31.6 going from first to third. Just a ridiculous play. And then to cap it off, you know, he's at third with nobody out. And Cedric Mullins hits a pretty shallow fly ball to center field with Aaron Judge, who has a great arm playing center. You know, slow runners do not tag up on that ball. But when you have Mateo, you send him. And Mateo dashes home, slides in safely to give the Orioles a 4-3 to three lead on the sack fly. He was just making everything happen with the stolen bases, with the base running. And he's hitting. He's getting himself on base. Had is huge, and he's he's basically penciled in in the nine hole at shortstop pretty much every game right now for the Orioles. And if he's doing this, that is huge for Baltimore. And I get, you know, even if he's playing like this, he might not be the Orioles' starting shortstop all year. Taron Vavra, Gunnar Henderson, Jordan Westberg, all pretty close to, to seem ready to come to the big leagues, all tearing it up at the plate in AAA right now and all infielders. So the O's are going to have to make some choices. And even with Jorge Mateo swinging it well, it's been really rough at times this season, but with such a good glove and all he brings with speed, even if the Orioles do call up all of those guys, I don't think Jorge Mateo is going to lose his roster spot. He may lose his starting shortstop spot at some point, but with everything else he gives you, I don't think you can take him off this team, even if he just ends up playing shortstop once a week and pinch running because he can change the game. You know, if a guy like, you know, Trey Mancini, you know, you're down one in the ninth. Trey Mancini leads off with a single. If you can bring in Jorge Mateo to pinch run for him, that changes the game because, you know, he's 23 for 27 stealing bases this year. He's probably going to get himself to second and score on any single. So it's been fun to watch. And, man, if he's hitting, makes the Euros lineup very, very different. He certainly is hitting over his last nine games. But speaking of hitting, you know, Jorge Mateo just – wasn't able to do enough to, to get the O's to a series win. And the guy who did do enough to get his team to a series win this weekend was, of course, Aaron Judge, who just obliterated the Orioles in these three games. And coming up next, I'll talk about what the O's did right and what they did wrong when facing Judge in terms of really the entire pitching staff and how they may want to approach it moving forward because they're obviously going to see Judge a, a few more times in some important games throughout the rest of this season. But first... 
do have to tell you about BlueNile.com. And whether you're ready to pop the question or you're celebrating a milestone moment, you can find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. What makes BlueNile.com so great is that they have simple online tools to let you choose diamond shape, size, and clarity, setting style, and here's the best part. They answer your questions. There are jewelry experts on hand 24-7, available via phone or chat, to help you find a memorable gift at every single budget. So if you don't know what you're looking for, the people at BlueNile.com can help you out. So make your moments sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And going on now is the Blue Nile Anniversary Sale. Save up to 40% on classic fine jewelry pieces and 25% on engagement ring settings. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. So Orioles and Yankees over the weekend, with the Yankees taking two of three from the O's, O's dropping to 47 and 48 on the season. My three big takeaways from the weekend and takeaway number two is that the Orioles just did not find the right combination to get Aaron Judge out this weekend. And that is really the number one reason why the Yankees came away with a series win. Aaron Judge on the weekend, eight for 13 with three homers, two doubles, eight RBIs. Now, of the five times that the O's got him out, four of them were strikeouts. So that helps. He did draw one walk. Uh, that came in his actually final plate appearance in the ninth inning on Sunday as well. Maybe he should have been walked a little more, and, and we'll get to that. But eight RPS, the Yankees scored 16 runs in three games this weekend. Judge drove in half of them, eight RBIs. He just did all the damage in the world to the Orioles, and he was doing it to all three starters and some of the relievers as well. You know, you start... With Friday, Tyler Wells wasn't at his best. Five innings, five runs, five hits, four Ks, and two walks. And Wells gave up two home runs. Oh, yeah, guess what? They were both to Aaron Judge. It was a three-run homer in the third inning by Judge that was crushed, that made it a 3 nothing game, and then hit a solo homer later in the game. And, and Wells just struggled to, to know what to do with Aaron Judge. And, you know, maybe you argue in the third inning Friday, oh, he should have walked Judge. It was first and second with two outs. You got a lefty and Rizzo on deck. You know, Wells has already retired Judge back in the first inning. You're not going to walk him there. You just, you got to make a better pitch. He goes behind 2-0 and and, and Judge going to make you pay. Then you go to Saturday. And while Jordan Lyles did not give up a home run to Aaron Judge, he made him work. And, and all those Yankees hitters really made Jordan Lyles work. I mean, he grinded through five innings, allowed three runs on eight hits, two Ks, two walks. He did allow a home run to Matt Carpenter, but it took him 99 pitches. He only had two whiffs in 99 pitches to get through five innings. He grinded out to Jordan Lyles and, and helped the Orioles stay in that game, allowed them to, to come back and win that Saturday night game. But, you know, even Aaron Judge had a, you know, little blue RBI single in that game off of Lyles. And, and he didn't pitch around him, but forced him to throw a lot more pitches than he probably wanted to. And then you go to Sunday, and guess what Aaron Judge does again? He homers off of Dean Kramer, who, you know, Dean Kramer had the best start of any of the three Orioles starters this weekend. You know, each guy went right around five innings. Nobody really pitched great. I mean, Kramer's line, five and a third. He allowed four runs on five hits, struck out six, and walked one and allowed one homer. And guess who? It was Aaron Judge in the third inning after D.J. LeMahieu's RBI double had put the Yankees up one nothing, You had Judge at the plate. You had two outs. You had a runner on second. And you had Judge already mashing you all weekend. That's got to be a spot where you just intentionally walk Judge. There's two down. First base is empty. And I get you've got a really good left-handed hitter in Rizzo on deck with a right-handed pitcher on the mound in Dean Kramer and a right-handed hitter in Judge. But Judge is so locked in this year, and especially against the Orioles, you just got to take your chances against Rizzo, who really didn't have a great weekend or anything hitting behind Judge. You have to take your chances with Rizzo, and he has burned the Orioles early this season, but you got to walk him. And, you know, I, I tweeted this out from the at Locked on Orioles account. I understand the mindset to not walk Judge there. You know, it's a one nothing game. You're in the top of the third inning. You know, it's not like Kramer's pitch count was getting super high. He had, he pitched really well until the LeMahieu RBI double put the Yankees on the board. He had already struck out Judge. You know, he he 
Kramer struck Judge out in their first meeting in the top of the first inning. So, you know, he had already gotten him once. And I get, you know, you don't want to, maybe not a, you're not in a high leverage spot yet. You're in the third inning. You don't want to put guys on in the third. I kind of get that mindset, but it's Aaron Judge. He's the best hitter in baseball right now. He's clobbering you all weekend. You have a base open with two outs. And that's the big difference here. If there's one out or nobody out, I think I pitch to him. But with two outs, you just go at Rizzo. You, you got to go at Rizzo. And he got Rizzo after, after Judge hits the homer. But Kramer hangs a 1-1 curveball to him. And Judge, I mean, just... Mm, there's not even a... It's not even a, a, a verb for what he did to that baseball. I guess obliterated would work into deep left field for a two-run homer that made it a 3 nothing game and kind of took some steam out of the Orioles there because you feel like you just want to walk him there and Brandon Hyde didn't do it. And again, I get the mindset, but you you just got to overcome that and and walk judge there. And at the end of the day, he just clobbered the Orioles. And he wasn't the only guy who had like a great weekend. I mean, DJ LeMay, who I mentioned, had four hits. Jose Trevino had five hits, including you know Trevino had a four for four in Sunday's game. He was huge in that win for the Yankees. But at the end of the day, it was judge, judge, judge. And, and some other guys got on base and, and did some things. And, you know, you, you allowed guys like Gallo and Kyle Higashioka to maybe have a little better weekends than you would like. But man, he's good. He's, he's the best hitter in baseball right now. You just, you got to put him on there and you got to find a, a better way to go at him. You can't allow eight for 13 weekends. If you're going to allow five for 13 weekends. Okay. You can't allow eight for 13 with three home run weekends. And Dean Kramer attacked him okay a couple of times and struck him out twice. Brian Baker, I thought, attacked him really well on Friday night when he struck him out coming out of the bullpen. So there were guys who were able to go get him, but he just, everything worked for him. And not everything worked for Orioles starters this weekend who allowed 12 earned runs in 15 and a third innings pitched. It was not a, a, you know, a banner showing for the Orioles rotation against that Yankee offense. This weekend, but speaking of guys who struggled, you know, there were still some, some solid points for, for guys like Wells and and Lyles, who was gritty and even Dean Kramer, you know, besides Aaron judge, I thought pitched okay with the six strikeouts, one shy of his career high. But when you turn it to the hitting side, you know, the O's did score six on Friday and, and six on Saturday, and you'll take six runs every time you go out there, but they were of course shut out on Sunday. And a lot of that had to do with, you know, a couple of guys just really, really struggling. A couple of their big hitters really struggling at the plate this weekend. We'll talk about that coming up right after this. But first, got to tell you about betonline.net, your number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. And, you know, you go to Bet Online to find your favorite sports and events, the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. And you can find reviews and news on every league, including, of course, Major League Baseball. But we got the NFL coming up, college football, combat sports, esports, even golf every single weekend as well. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information. They've got live in game betting. You can check the score. You can listen to podcasts. They have you covered. So head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today at Bet Online where the game starts. So we're chatting Orioles and Yankees in a three-game series at Camden Yards. Yankees taking two out of three from the Orioles to open the, quote, second half of the season. And, you know, for the O's, as I mentioned, 12 runs in the first two games, they split them. You'll take that offensively. But it was tough to watch the Oriole offense in the Sunday game. They lose 6 nothing. They're shut out for just the seventh time all season in the rubber match as the Yankees take the series. And you saw some guys struggle who really struggled all weekend. And that was two of the Orioles' best hitters this season in Ryan Mountcastle and Trey Mancini. Neither of those guys had a hit. Mountcastle on the weekend, 0 for 10, with four strikeouts and two walks and only two hard hit balls. And Trey Mancini in the series, 0 for 11, with two walks, four strikeouts. Now, he did have four hard hit balls, but... You cannot have a combined 0 for 21 from Mancini and Mountcastle and expect to win a series. It's just not going to happen. Those two guys are too important to the Orioles' offense. And this is kind of a, a different piece of a bigger picture for each of these guys. I mean, you start with Mountcastle. He was hitting the ball really well before the All-Star break. He had hits in eight of his last nine games before the All-Star break. 
was swinging it very well. You know, his underlying numbers and his stat cast numbers, they're just off the charts. He's hitting the ball so, so hard. And, you know, his stats should continue to go up. Just a little bit of a rough weekend for him. Just a lot of different Yankees pitchers had him fooled this weekend. But I I don't see any issue for Ryan Mountcastle. But you can't you can't have him go 0 for 10. You, you need him to come up in some spots, and he just did not this weekend. But for Mancini, it's been a little bit more of an extended struggle. Now, again, the 0 for 11 over the weekend, and I'll give him credit, four hard hit balls. He probably deserved one or two hits over the weekend. But in his last five games, now this goes back to the final two games in Tampa before the All-Star break, and then all three against the Yankees this weekend. Mancini doesn't have a hit. He is 0 for 20 over his last five games. That includes three walks, but nine strikeouts in that stretch. And for Trey Mancini, it continues a very weird trend this season. Now, again, you know, this isn't the greatest look into what he's doing if we're going to talk batting average here, because as we know, batting average certainly does not tell the entire story of how a hitter is doing. But to break it down, at least to that, it, it does show you a little bit. It's not, you know, completely useless. And for Trey Mancini, his month was May. That dude was ripping, ripping the baseball in the month of May when he hit 363 in May. Now, the other three months, it's been a bit of a struggle. And we know the story for Trey Mancini this year. You know, the underlying and expected numbers are way better than his actual numbers. You know, he his expected home runs are still eight more than his actual home runs that he's hit. You know, he's been robbed by, you know, Baltimore out there multiple times this year. He's hit the ball really hard and been robbed so many times. Just been an unlucky hitter so far this season. At the end of the day, you know, he had a 116 WRC plus coming into play on Sunday. So it's not like he's having a bad year by any stretch of the imagination. But it's been really interesting when you kind of break it down to what he has done throughout this season. Because he's now hitting 225 in July after the 0 for 11 weekend. He hit just 229 in June, and he hit just 224 in April. So yes, the May was absolutely outstanding, but... At the end of the day, his other months have not nearly lived up to what he did in the month of May. And listen, you know, in terms of other numbers, he's still been solid. In June, you know, in May, he had a 164 WRC plus. In June, he had a 120 WRC plus. Yeah, his average wasn't there, but when he was hitting, he was hitting for power, he was hitting home runs, he was hitting doubles, that was still there. But it was a 65 WRC plus in April and just a 92 WRC plus so far in July. Remember, 100 is league average. Anything above 100 is you're better than average. Anything below is you're, you're, you know, you're that percent better than average. So if he has a 120 WRC plus in June, it means he was 20% better than the average major league hitter. 92 in July means he's 8% worse than your average major league hitter. And for Trey Mancini, you know, obviously the O's need him to get going. He's a big part of this offense. But it's going to be really interesting to see if this slump continues. The trade deadline is eight days away. The trade deadline is next Tuesday. Is it going to hurt his trade value? I mean, he's on an 0 for 20 right now. And we know, you know, hey, he, he played right field on Sunday and nothing went poorly. He made every play that he needed to make. But most teams know they're not going to be trading for Trey Mancini to stick him defensively in the outfield. He's a first baseman slash DH. So if that guy's in a little bit of a slump, does the team really want to trade for him when there are certainly other options out there at that position? And does this slump make the Orioles more likely to hold on to him? Maybe not as much because they want to keep the team intact and they're playing well, but because they're going to get less for him because he's 0 for 20 and it's just not worth trading him. I think it's going to play a factor. You know, if a guy's 0 for 20 are less likely to trade for him at this point. And that's not going to weigh in a lot on other teams because they're going to see the the whole season of data. But you don't want to tr- you'd rather trade for a guy that's hitting hot when you trade for him than a guy in a big time slump. That's just what happens. So it'll certainly be interesting to to see how that plays out. And again, you know, 
some other guys in the Oriole offense had some some great weekends. I mean, Ramon Arias was five for twelve. Of course, had the the huge home run on Saturday night. Hit the two run homer to give the O's some breathing room and put him up six to three in the bottom of the eighth. That was, I mean, he cleared the big wall. That was a huge moment. Crowd went crazy at Camden Yards. Adley Rutschman was great this weekend. I mean, started hitting second for the first time. Brandon Hyde puts him in the two hole uh, in the first game out of the All Star break. He ends up five for ten with three walks on the weekend. Hey, Aaron Judge reached base nine times. Adley Rutschman reached base eight times on the weekend. And then Cedric Mullins, he had a five for 10 as well and and made some things happen. So some guys were certainly hitting, but when you have a combined 0 for 21 from Mancini and Mountcastle, who are always hitting between second and fifth in the Orioles lineup, it's going to hurt you. It's going to lead to a shutout loss. That's what it led to on Sunday. And unfortunate for the O's to not get a series win. They showed they can hang with the Yanks. They get the Saturday game. They come up just short on Friday. This Yankees team is really, really good, though. And to, to have to face Cole and then Cortez, I mean, those two guys are dominant. Nestor Cortez might be pitching better than Garrett Cole right now. And those two are Cy Young candidates for sure. It's a tough Yankees team. But next up for the Orioles, they got the Tampa Bay Rays coming into town for a four-game series Monday through Thursday starting tonight. And I'll be back with you on the podcast tomorrow, recapping game one between the Orioles and the Rays. And then we're going to have a lot of trade deadline talk coming up on the pod this week. Because, of course, the trade deadline is just eight days away. We will look at maybe a bigger picture of who is most likely. We're going to do a power ranking on the podcast later later this week of maybe 10 or so players from most to least likely to be traded. We're also going to talk maybe Orioles-Mets trade rumors because Trey Mancini and Jorge Lopez have been potentially linked to the New York Mets in trade rumors And we'll talk about what other teams could be interested in Orioles. And also, if the Orioles are interested in being buyers, who they could target in that market, specifically when it comes to controllable starting pitching as well. But that's coming up throughout the rest of the week on the pod, starting when I'm back with you here tomorrow. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day.